Yo, what's going on? It's your boy Mike D. Um, hope everybody's having a great day. But um, but dig this, man. I had an awesome thing happen recently, like today, actually. Um, I had the opportunity to chop it up with my 91, almost 92 year old grandmother. And um, <laughs> she still has all of her wits, um, her thought process, her, I mean, she's, she's all there, right? And so whenever I get an opportunity to chop it up with her and just learn and listen and just have a conversation, you know, I, I look at that as a blessing, right? And she's definitely one of my elders. One of the things that happened not too long ago, um, I was doing a documentary film with a guy and we talked about the concept of elder versus older. And elder is, in essence, a sign of respect, right? Like someone that's your elder is someone that you respect, that you hold in high esteem, whereas older tends to have the connotation of, you know, no longer useful or throw it away. And so that conversation through the filming of that documentary made me really think about those that have come before me in my life. Um, those that, you know, are my ancestors or, you know, came before me. I no longer need to refer to them as being older. They are my elders. Right. So it's not making them deities or it's not like making them all, you know, godlike figures, but it's showing your respect. Right. And that's something that I think we need to, um, spend a lot more time doing is really making sure to refer to our previous generation as elders and not just older. And I, I see that a lot now um, with a lot of the things that pop out, you know, a lot of the new the new voices and the things that are, you know, coming to the forefront, especially with social media, you know, giving everyone in essence a media company in their pocket. There's a lot of folks who literally are kind of squashing the previous generation or are really not showing reverence and or respect for those that came before us. Though those that came before us may have done things a little bit differently, they are still the shoulders that we are standing upon or that we are building upon. And so, you know, rethinking the whole concept of elder versus older really had me to, you know, just reevaluate how I communicate and how I position myself as it as it pertains to folks that came before me. And so today, when I was able to have a conversation with my grandmother, it was kind of that reaffirming notion that I'm in the presence of elders, not someone that's older. And um, just sitting and really talking with her and, you know, we were talking via phone because she lives in another city for me. Um, you know, every time we talk, she kind of she goes into some history like I don't know what spawns these conversations, but every so often she'll go into history and it leads down this path of really uncovering something that I didn't know a whole lot about. Or maybe I heard something about, but those nuances were never, um, you know, clearly drawn out. You know, it's just kind of like a hearsay thing. So today we were talking about food at one point. And we were talking about eating and all of that. And <laughs> we talked about fruits and snacking and all. And literally out of the blue, she mentioned that her grandfather, her grandfather's name was Jackson Harris. Her grandfather used to love to eat apples and pears and, and all of that. But he was a candy maker. So he didn't eat a lot of candy. He didn't snack on a lot of candy. He always ate things like apples and all of that. I guess he had a lot of... um you know, experience or a lot of time around the candy. So he was just like, I don't need to eat a whole lot of it. But he ate a lot of apples. But the funny thing was she mentioned that he didn't have any teeth. Yeah, it's pretty funny, right? He didn't have any teeth. She said he could gum the apples or gum those pears. And we used to be amazed because grandpapa could eat an apple, eat a pear, and he didn't have no teeth. Interesting. It was pretty funny, but like little nuances. But that was coming from a conversation that I had. And I'd never heard that nuance about him liking apples and pears, but then, you know, not having any teeth, which was kind of funny to me. So we laughed a lot about that. But one of the things that she mentioned was he would always walk home from work and he worked at uh, in Augusta 
It was a formerly known as the Hollingsworth Candy Company, but he worked for the Hollingsworth Candy Company and he was actually the candy maker. And basically what she mentioned to me was that when Hollingsworth Candy Company was founded or was created, you know, my this would be my great great grandfather because it's my grandmother's grandfather. He, in essence, was the candy maker, whereas there was another guy who I guess had the money and put up the money and all of that. You know, this is in the early 1900s. And so um, so my great great grandfather was the candy maker. And there was another guy who was, in essence, the business guy who had him to come and make the candy. Um, But she went on to tell that, you know, he would walk home from work. And as he would walk home from work, he would, um, you know, he would uh, he said all the ladies in the neighborhood would know when he was coming home or coming down the street because for some odd reason they would always be out near their front fence and he would always give them a piece of candy. And if he didn't have a piece of candy, he'd always give the ladies an apple. Right. And so uh, so we, I laughed about it. But then I was just like, uh, Grandma, so what did his wife say about him handing all this candy out to all these ladies on the street as he came home? And she said, oh, she didn't worry. She used to walk up and down the street with her hands behind her back and uh, she knew what was going on. And so it was funny <laughs> because she was mentioning that, you know, she also mentioned that, you know, some people would get jealous, but nobody got jealous. She was all right. He would come down the street. She might be out in her garden. She'd see him and tell him to go on inside. The food's ready and he would go on in. But the whole issue of handing out the candy and the apples to the neighboring ladies was not an issue. I don't know if that would be the same case today in, you know, 2019, but uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it was just cool. But she was just talking about these things and the way that my grandmother was describing it. I could close my eyes and envision my great great grandfather walking home from the candy factory, handing out candy to the ladies in the, in the uh, you know, at the edge of their yard by the fence. Or if he didn't have candy, he would hand out apples walking down the street and you know, great, great grandma standing in the garden with her hands behind her back or sitting on her bench as he was walking to the house and her letting him know that, you know, the food's ready. It's like I could envision that whole thing. And this whole thing was an encounter with my elders, one of my elders. And I, I, I want to encourage everyone watching this to make sure to spend time with your elders even if it's not physically spending time, if you have to, you know, make a phone call or Skype or whatever, spend some time with your elders because little nuances like that are things that no longer are around when our elders are no longer here. And so we need to take time to to sit down, to, you know, cherish these things, to learn a little bit, because as you learn about your elders, you start to learn more about yourself. And um, as I mentioned before, you know, we are building on the shoulders of giants or we are building upon what was already laid for us. But if we don't know what was laid for for us or laid before us, we have no clue as to what we're starting with and we don't know what starting point we're coming from. And so it's important to spend time with your elders, not those that are older, because older has the connotation of no longer useful. But spending time with your elders and really getting some of these nuances of your history, because that helps to tell your story. And so, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, she mentioned to me and I had heard this throughout the time, you know, throughout, you know, various family talks or whatnot, that he used to work for the uh, Hollingsworth Candy Company. And he was the one that was behind the actual candy making. But it was this other guy who put the money up. And so it just made me want to go and kind of research a little bit the history of the Hollingsworth Candy Company in Augusta, Georgia. And when I read all the history of the Hollingsworth Candy Company, I see in 1909, a guy named um, P. Virgil Hollingsworth invested $200 in a, uh, a bankrupt candy kitchen. And from there, he ended up building the Hollingsworth, initially Hollingsworth Tut Candy Company. And that ended up merging with Hollingsworth, I think, uh, let me see, Hollingsworth Nunnally. And then eventually they created Fine Products Corporation in 1932. And, excuse me, according to what I found online, it was one of the largest candy manufacturers in the South. Internationally renowned and all of that. But in 1909, when 
P. Virgil Hollingsworth invested $200 in a um, bankrupt candy kitchen. Who was the candy maker? See, I started connecting the dots and I started thinking about it. I was like, you know, this is interesting. All of this history that was listed, you know, about the Hollingsworth Candy Company and this entrepreneur who came from a $200 investment in 1909 to create this magnificent candy empire. But there was no mention of my great great grandfather, Jackson Harris. It's interesting. And again, when you hear these stories, it allows you to then build upon that. When I think about what I'm doing as far as like, you know, creating media and podcasting and writing books and speaking um, and wanting to help to improve the quality of life of anybody that I touch and, you know, helping to create a legacy, but then to also um, help to reshape the narrative of the stories that are being told about, uh, especially folks of, of African-American descent. You know, I think about, you know, my whole entrepreneurial growth and journey. And then I look back to my great, great grandfather, who was the artisan behind this empire initially, but yet there was no recognition there. It's, it's interesting. It makes you think, because, again, it goes back to the notion of listening to your elders, taking the stories and understanding a piece of who you are, but then building upon that. And so one of the things that, you know, it made me think about was this concept of, yes, it's nice to create, but we also have to get to a place in which we can own. And um, looking at the landscape of living in 2019, you know, that's one of the things that I want to take going forward. And it's not about me being remembered and me being listed in the storyline of whatever I create, but it's about the family legacy being able to be a part of the big things that get created. And a lot of that is tied into owning what it is you create or being a part of the ownership of that. Because if not, you kind of get written out of history, even though you were a vital part of the history. And sometimes these conclusions come in various forms, but this conclusion of mine would not have come if I didn't spend time communicating with my elder and her giving her firsthand account of some historical facts and then me using the technology of today to deep dive into what's going on and to learn and build upon it, without that, I wouldn't have come to this conclusion. And so I guess at the end of the day today, I want to encourage everyone watching this to spend time with your elders. Well, first and foremost, I want you to start reframing the concept of older and start viewing those that came before you as your elders. Reframe the conversation. Older is something that's no longer useful. Elder is something to be honored and respected. So spend time with your elders. Learn. Process. Learn a little bit about yourself because there's a little bit of you in that timeline. But then also think about how can you then push the narrative forward and take it to the next level because it's incumbent upon us to be that bridge. Eventually, I will be someone's elder. Someone's going to come to me for you know insight and advice. And so as we carry this narrative forward, we can't forget where we've come from. All right. So y'all spend time, you know, doing that, but really spend some time bridging the gap. You know, I know there's a lot of excuse me, new age things that are out there and new perspectives, which are good. Those are things to build upon. But do not forget where we come from either. Do not forget your history, because there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from there to not repeat some of the negativity or to not repeat some of the things that maybe didn't lead to great outcomes. But then there's some great stuff to do build upon as well, in which we have a blueprint or a framework to to add to what we've done or what we are doing. So take time with your elders and um, learn, build, grow. And um, 
Let's see what this thing does in the future. All right, y'all. Hey, I appreciate you. Visit IamMikeDorsey.com if you're interested in me coming out and speaking to your group. Um, grab a copy of my latest book, Dynamic Black Fatherhood Manifesto on Amazon, or you can get it from uh, IamMikeDorsey.com or BlackFathersNow.com. A couple of different places. Check out the podcast, um, Black Fathers Now, anywhere you listen to podcasts. And um, I look forward to chopping, up with, chopping it up with y'all at another time. Be blessed, well, and wise. Peace.